Here we are in Los Angeles, California with Jimmy Diggs who was a writer for Star Trek Voyager and Star Trek uh, Deep Space Nine. That's correct. And a uh, very impressive fellow. Uh, Jimmy, can you tell us a little bit more of your background beyond that? Where are you from, how about? Uh, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan and uh, the Navy brought me out to California during the Vietnam War and I just stayed. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, what got you into writing? I actually, um, that came at me like a steamroller out of the dark. I was actually a security guard on the set of Stu Siegel Productions and uh, it ra rained one night and the executive producer lost his keys and with my flashlight I helped him find him and uh, he looked important so I just asked him, I said, hey, I've got some ideas for the show, who do I talk to? And he says, well, you talk to me, come down to my studio in Burbank and we'll talk about whatever ideas you've got. So. Uh, it seemed like, uh, the truth was, I was lying. I didn't have a single idea in my head. It just seemed like the right thing to say <laughs> to this individual. Awesome. And uh, I went, at the time, I was thinking about doing some acting, so I had a drama coach. And uh, I went to her and I said, hey, this executive producer fella said I could uh, pitch my story ideas to him. And she flipped out. She goes, oh my god, that's an agent. You have, I mean, that's a call to pitch, and you have to have an agent to, to get those. So. Uh, she told me basically what to do, beginning, middle, and end, broad stroke my ideas, don't take longer than a couple of paragraphs to do it. And then I ran to the bookstore and bought a book, How to Write for Television, and read it over the weekend. Then I went into the pitch at Burbank, and while I was pitching my stories, the executive producer looked and smiled and nodded. And when I was done, he said the thing that changed my life forever. He said, Jimmy, when I first met you, I thought you'd have some wacky ideas, and I tell you, don't lose your day job. <laughs> said, but in reality, you are an artist, and I want to do that for the first episode next season. And I was floored. I said, but you got to write it, and it's got to be good. So I went to head to write it, but like all new actors, I got stuck in this, not actors, all writers, I got stuck in the second act. Uh, and I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. I was so green, I didn't know that if you've got a problem in the second act, it's because you've got a problem in the first act. Uh -huh. But I didn't know that. So uh, I'm stuck, I can't seem to get out of it, so I said, you know what, maybe I need to just enjoy myself for a little bit, relax, and, and, and get the creative juices flowing again. So I went to my first Star Trek convention, and I'm having a great <laughs> time. And it just so happened that at that convention, the writers for the show were there, and they, they gave seminars on how to write at the time. So I'm, I'm just standing next to them nonchalantly, and we're talking, and they're asking questions about what I do for a living, and I say, yeah, but I'm trying to write a script, and they go, you're trying to write a script? So, well, and I said, yeah, but I'm having trouble. He says, well, I'll tell you what, come to our seminar. We'll give you our, our resource materials and be able to help. So I go to the seminar, and right away they put up something on the screen called a beat outline. And I take one look at that thing, and I realize that's the tool I need to get out of the second act. So I take it home. I finish my script. But by the time I got it done, the executive producer who wanted to buy it couldn't because he had gotten into an argument with his boss, who was Stephen J. Cannell. You know, <laughs> I don't wow. remember, but at the end of the shows, he used to type into his typewriter and throw the paper up in the air. The creator of the A Team and right. Wise Guys. Well, he had gotten into an argument with the guy who wanted to buy my episode, and uh, the guy who wanted to buy my episode was getting fired. He says, Jimmy, I feel bad. Uh, I can't buy the show now. What can I do to make it up to you? Well, off the top of my head, I say, Who do you know in Star Trek? Come to find out that when Nick, that was the executive producer's name, had been the executive producer of The Hulk with Lou Ferrigno. Wow. That he had bought the first two episodes ever written by Jerry Taylor and Michael Piller, who are now the executive producers of Star Trek The Next Generation. He fired my script off to them, they read it, they liked it, and they liked enough to hire me as a writer intern on Star Trek The Next Generation. And that's how I started learned to uh, my craft by studying and working under their tutelage and on my very first pitch to Star Trek I sold and I just kept selling and kept selling and now I've, as it happens, I've sold more episodes to that franchise than any other freelance writer in the history of Star Trek. Awesome. Very cool. So uh, what is a crypto historian? Well, Crypto Historians is my brand new steampunk television series. And it's a story of a bunch of historians who are members of a secret organization whose duty it is to study history try to anticipate the divergent 
uh, or aberrant timelines and stop them so that they can guide humanity to a perfect destiny. So they're time travelers and they're historians and you might think of them as uh, they are to history what Indiana Jones is to archaeology. Very cool. But that comparison really doesn't work because as everyone knows history is infinitely more dangerous than archaeology. Uh, because those who fail to learn from history may not live to repeat it. So these guys uh, use time travel. They, they've discovered the time travel secrets of H.G. Wells and Nikola Tesla and they are using those secrets to protect the planet Earth from the greatest disasters that mankind has ever known. One of the biggest is that they discovered that the writings of H.G. Wells are true and that the Martian invasion in 1938 in Grover's Mill, New Jersey was real, that it actually happened, and that the United States government uh, created a fictitious radio program to cover up the real invasion. <laughs> really? And now that the Martians are coming back, they they feel they understand what's going on with Earth's microbial defenses, they can combat them now, and they're ready to wipe us out. And the crypto historians are struggling against what they know about this upcoming invasion, trying to convince the world, but yet trying to do so in a way that doesn't alter our timeline and then have us skittering off into oblivion because history has been irrevocably changed for the worse. Very cool. Thanks so much for telling about uh, crypto historians, but where are you going to go with that? Well, we have just started our Kickstarter drive. For those of you who may not know what Kickstarter is, it's called crowdfunding. Um, the fans can send in donations to get a project off the ground. Go to kickstarter.com and you'll see what it's all about. Worthwhile projects can get funding when they can't get them from the studios. Um, that's the problem with a lot of great sci-fi projects. They can never get off the ground because the studios just won't put the money behind them that it takes to get them done. Um, the studios always want pre-sold properties. And you know, I love Spider-Man and Iron Man and all the rest of those comic book characters just like anyone else. But there are a lot of worthwhile projects out there that deserve to be done. And this time, we can do it without the studios. You can donate funds and several incredible series are now getting off the ground because of Kickstarter and that's what we're trying to do. So we can really, we can really use your help and to help get this worthwhile project off the ground. It's a steampunk adventure unlike anything that has ever been seen on, set, on television before. And with everyone's help, we can get this done and we can make this dream a reality and give you the kind of high quality science fiction steampunk stories that this, the people who love this subgenre of science fiction and people who love science fiction and good storytelling at all will be able to get behind. We have a motto with the Crypto Historians that the future is in your hands. And the life of this production truly is in the hands of the fans. The future truly is in your hands. Okay, uh, Crypto Historian sounds great, Jimmy, but uh, what's it in it for the fans that uh, support you? Do you have any good perks? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, just like with any good drive, if you donate money, you get certain incentives. Uh, it might be a copy of the show, it might be a t-shirt, It might. we have um, licenses for temporal adventure, we have airship registry certificates where you can register your airship. We have uh, some more interesting perks as well. We have something called pseudopods. These are captured Martian life forms. They're movie quality maquettes. They're about this big. Uh, they also have bioluminescence. They glow in the dark. You flash a red light over these things. They look amazing. They look like they were grown on another alien environment. And uh, they're absolutely gorgeous. And no two are alike. They're all different. Okay. Uh, some of the more interesting perks that we have is if you give at uh, one of the more significant levels, you can actually get a co-starring role in an episode where you awesome. get five lines or less. Uh, at another level, you can get a guest starring role. And in that guest starring role, you can portray one of the many historical figures that we meet in our time travel adventures. Uh, you can also, if you give at a certain level, have a character named after you. You can have a ship or a gourmet dish or a village named after you. Very cool. 
Now, I've got to ask you one final question. I like to close my interviews with asking you to tell me something weird and wonderful about yourself, since this is the Weird Review. Well, not too many people are aware of this, uh, but my father was a mortician. And I was raised above the funeral home for the first four years of my life. And uh, just like any child, what you see is what you know, and you don't think there's anything unusual about it. And my father felt that he didn't want to hide anything about the realities of life from me. And uh, he never hid any of the secrets about life or death. So he would be in the morgue working on a body, and I would be going around him on my tricycle, and you know, an arm <laughs> would slip off the table. I'd push it back up there and just keep going. Uh, well, one day, as it was in the 50s, you know, people used to get dressed up to go out to dinner. And when I was about four years old, my folks had decided I'd been table trained enough and they were ready to take us, take me on our first dinner at a friend's house. And so they wrapped, they uh, dressed me up in my little sailor suit and took me to the friend's house for dinner. And uh, my table manners were impeccable as I had been trained. And then after the main course, I excused myself from the table to go to the restroom. But the hostess noticed I'd been gone for a long time. So she went looking for me. When she found me, she saw me looking under the beds and in the closets and around things. And so she just gently took me by the hand back to the table, set me down, and as she was giving out the dessert, she asked me what I was looking for. And rather matter-of-factly, I just looked up to her and said, well, I was wondering where they kept their dead people. Because I knew that we had dead people in our house. I knew that people lived and people died. He had to do some of the bodies. To my mind, it was an eminently logical question. <laughs> I, I can see how that would be. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it wasn't a polite table conversation, but you know, there you go. Well, the, that has got to be one of the most unusual responses I've heard to it, <laughs> but I love it. Well, thank you so much, Jimmy. Well, thank and you. I'm looking forward to seeing crypto historians and when you got your kids started getting going, uh, send me an email. Please okay? do. And everybody, please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, go to www.cryptohistorians.com and most of all, most of all, tell all of your friends about our Kickstarter drive. This is going to be a wonderful series, time travel, think of it as Sherlock Holmes in outer space. Top hats, canes, and spaceships to Mars. That's what we're all about. Totally awesome. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you. And from Los Angeles, California, this has been The Weird Review.